at the start, I think it's the time. Um, hello everybody, I'm Cristina Chumillas, I'm a designer and front-end developer at Timbra, a design and Drupal shop based in Barcelona, and you can find me as Secrina on Drupal.org or IRC or Chumillas on, on Twitter. First, uh, we are going to check that statement that Mary Mickey ma made uh, on 2008, saying that mobile was going to overtake fixed internet access by the year 2014. And it was something like that because actually uh, last year in the state it was around 70% of traffic uh, for mobiles, and I think in the UK it was around 66%, so something like that. But what actually happened is that mobile isn't killing the desktop. What it actually is happening is that users are, ha are having multi-device experiences. They start, for example, on the desktop, and they, then they follow on the, on the mobile. For example, you search an address on the desktop, then you send it to your, mo to your mobile, and then you get the directions to go to the place. So that's not exactly like that. And it was around six years ago when Ethan Marcot um, named the responsive web design. And a lot of stuff has changed since, since then. A lot of processes, a lot of things have changed. So for example, the processes have, uh, have been evolving since then. For example, the content first and the mobile first are really a thing nowadays. Not everybody does that. Um, content first is uh, having the, the main content, the most relevant content first on, uh, on the website and keeping that in mind. And mobile first is thinking first on mobile. The first the display, the first is a small display that the user is going to see. And then just work together with, with content first and now then you have the thing that has to be on the first place. Another thing that has, that has changed uh, since then is that we don't work or we shouldn't work anymore with static compositions, Photoshop, PSD, uh, PNGs. We shouldn't work with that anymore. Instead of that, we should use responsive prototypes. Why? Because the, deci the deci decisions, the decisions should be taken on the browser because at the end is where the user will consume your site. So you should decide on the browser. So you should go quickly to the browser and give prototypes to the to the customer because there the customer will be able to decide if he wants that or not. Another thing that has changed is we don't work with lorem ipsum, with custom, uh, uh, with default content anymore, because you know everything works on design. All the lines for a teaser have two lines. All of them works together, and that's not the real life. You know, you have a real content, and you have one teaser with only one line. The next one have five lines, and it's almost impossible to uh, to make a design design work if it doesn't been on the design for the f uh, from the from the beginning so we should we, uh, we should use real content and design with extreme cases and the last years uh, atomic design and components have been also a thing a really a really important thing because it has changed the way we design the way we um, conceive the, the the webs because we don't we shouldn't be thinking on pages anymore. We shouldn't give to the, fi we, to the final uh, client, we give them a page. Of course, we won't give them only the, the, a style guide, but we need to think on different components to reuse them all among the site. Another important thing is performance. And performance is really, really important on responsive web design. Because actually, actually, it was what the detractors of responsive web, de web design used against responsive, because they they said that responsive was a performance, and actually, it was like that in some uh, uh, in some pages some years ago, 
but it was on fault of the, the, the fault wasn't about the responsive design, it was about, it was the implementation, it was on the techniques. So when we talk about performance, we talk about user experience, because if your site is going to take more than four seconds to be load, probably the si around the 64% 64 of a smartphone user will just leave your page. They won't wait. And bad news is that the page average is increasing year after year. Last year, only last year, it was about uh, 16% of, uh, uh, of, of weight. And the year before, it was 15. So it's increasing a lot. Nowadays, the average is around 2.2 .2 megabytes. And that's a lot. What I really, really, really like uh, on work, uh, about working on, on performance is having a budget for performance to say, OK, my website will, ha will have around one megabyte, two megabytes. Let's be realistic. So if uh, did this website, I really, really, really love it. Try it, because it's uh, performancebudget.io. It's really useful. And for example, if I want my site load in two seconds, let's, see, let's say on a 3G, fast 3G, because not everybody have 4G, but let's say a fast website. How many megas or gas do you think the website should have to be loaded in only two seconds? Any idea? No? No ideas? 200 gas. Only 200 gas on a 3G. It's, it's science fiction. I don't know you, but on my, in the last four years, I haven't had any website just with that. It's impossible. Just you to see that uh, having that, uh, we should have around 125 images, uh, cast for images. It's like you won't have a hero, a huge hero image. It's impossible with 200 cast. And seven cast for CSS. That's not too much. And let's remember that 10 cast for fonts. I will talk about that, that later. So when we talk about performance at this user experience, we talk about the perceived performance. And it will be the most critical metric, because on, for interactions, we say that one, mega, uh, sorry, one second, uh, an interaction happens after, uh, before one second, around one second, we perceive it at immediate. Or, uh, between one second and time five seconds is something that that's okay. It's human interaction. Between five and ten seconds, there there's a limit span. You still have the user there, but but more than ten seconds, the the user has gone. You don't have the user there anymore, or at least her, his attention. So, what can we do if we have a two megabytes for a website and we only have two seconds? What can we do? The perceived performance is, what is where it comes. Let's see, for example, you go to a bar, to a restaurant, and you order, order something. And you are waiting around 10 minutes until the, the, the food is there. So you are like that, just waiting, doing nothing. It will be a lot waiting 10 minutes. But what if on the time that you get your food, someone brings you your drinks and also bring you bring some snacks. You're doing something on that time. So you perceive that 10 minutes in a completely different way. So that's a perceived performance. Let's see this uh, example. I really like it because they really do it quite well. Uh, it's a list apart, a list apart website. I'm sure some of you will know it. And what they do is, well, at the beginning, there's the, uh, the HTML call. Uh, the parser goes there and reads the CSS, the jQuery and modernizer, that some, that some GS. And when the parser and the browser render all that stuff, something appears on the, on the screen. This something is content. You can read the content. But let's see here that there's no fonts loaded. Not yet. 
So you are reading something, you can do something, you actually can read the content, but you don't have anything else. You don't have the logo, you don't have the fonts, you don't have anything else, just the main CSS and jQuery and modernizer. So that's a really thing. You still are doing something. Then other images, other GS are uh, downloaded. Then you have here the logo, the header image. And suddenly, the text, this text disappears. <coughs> What's that? I will talk about this later, but it's a flash of invisible text. Because, look here, fonts are being detected. So the browser says, I have to load the fonts. When I have the fonts, I show the fonts. And then other stuff is downloaded. So that's the, that's the perceived performance. And that's something that we can do. We can custom our, our themes or CSS or implementation to, to, uh, to uh, play with the, with, the with the perceived performance. Here I have a small uh, demo with the same, a 3G uh, connection on mobile with the same uh, list apart um, uh, website. And let's see. Here is the connection. There is nothing here. Then there is the content, some GS, some images. The text disappears, and it's just going on everything on there, on its place. So you, are, you can start doing something before uh, actually you have all the stuff from the, web, from the website. So when we do responsive, we should, that, we should keep that in mind. So some tips will be optimize your image files, concatenate your text files, your CSS, JavaScript, minify them, compress them, of course, and cache, cache everything you can. So if you see that, Drupal Core does all that stuff. But who works? Who builds websites only with Drupal Core? No one. So there's always something that we can do to improve the implementation. So, if we are doing our theme, we will, be, we will uh, have to structure and optimize our CSS. For doing that, we have the CSS methodologies, the object-oriented CSS, BEM, block element modifier. There's a lot of stuff around that, but the most important one for theming is the, um, is the naming, block element modifiers, name the elements according to that. Smacks is more a structure, a way to structure your CSS. Uh, you have the layout, you have the, the uh, each component, you have the theme layer. So it's a good way to, it's a good thing to follow to work on your uh, theme. And why are they important? Because you reuse your CSS. If you reuse your CSS, you reduce your page size and you increase the page rendering speed. So it's faster. You also make faster the rendering. What do I, what do I mean? If, some, if, for example, you have uh, the class box, the class child, and the title inside, you have that, and you want to go to the title, and you will see, OK, the browser will go, will find all the boxes, the last one, and then the title inside. Yeah? No. The, wor the, the, the thing is not that easy. The browser, what we'll do is we'll find all the titles on the page, then we'll find the box, the last box, and then it will be parsed, it will be rendered. So it's really, really important to have only one class for each element, because it will be faster for the rendering. Of course, uh, these uh, methodologies make your projects uh, large scale ready. You can make huge projects. And it helps you to figure out what your designs are going to be made of. And it helps you getting started in a project because you know where the stuff will be and how it should work. And style guides. You know what are style guides, right? OK, living style guides are just a living, doc are just a li a living document of code that details all the elements of your site. Okay. 
from here, that's okay. But what happens if you go and change your CSS because something is, is changed? Then the, the style guide is outdated. And an outdated style guide is a completely useful, uh, useless tool. If you don't use it, you don't invest your time on that. But the first time you have been, you, you used to build that uh, style guide, it's completely useful, uh, useless then also. So you must have living style guides if you have living style guides, because otherwise yeah, they are useless. There are different ways to implement it, but the most important thing is that they give faster build times for new sections and pages because you know where is everything, where you have to go uh, uh, to find the way of building something. Uh, it standardizes the CSS, it keeps it small, and the design consistency is easier to maintain because you always know where to go to see what's the correct title, the correct color, so it's easier. So they are really useful. If you don't use living style guides, you will end up with 50 shades of gray. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that on many projects or in many designs and it's awful. So, ah, sorry, wrong button. Okay, another thing that we have, uh, we need to have in mind is the difference between fix, uh, fixed pixels versus relative units. Um, no, no. Um, okay, we have the pixels, uh, the AMs and RAMs. Uh, usually, one AM and one RAM is sixteen pixels. That's the uh, default for all browsers, unless you define something else on your base theme. And, um, no, okay, let's forget it. And uh, the best one between them, of course, we are doing responsive, we don't use pixels anymore. Between AMs and RAMs, we should use always, as we can, that we can, we should use RAMs, why? because they are more reliable. Because if imagine that you have a title inside the teaser, inside the sidebar, and you have uh, one dot one uh, from the previous one, on that uh, one dot one AM on the teaser, and one dot one AM on the title. If you don't know or do you, on, you don't remember that you are working on AMs so and you already have 1.1 a.m. on the previous element, on the father element, you will end up with a 19 font. But if you work with RAMs, you don't have to care about that. So that's better always that you can work with RAMs. Another thing that I love, because I just discovered them one year ago, and it was like, oh, where have you been? Is the viewport size units that for building hero images are super useful. And actually, they have been, I think, for four years. Even Internet Explorer works like that, with that. But there's a but always with Internet Explorer. They don't support uh, VMAX. But here we have an example for these um, viewport units. And another thing that is really important on responsive design is typography and working with responsive typography. How we decide which font size we should use? Okay, we know that on, that on mobiles we need to have a smaller size, on TVs we need to have a bigger one, but why? Because we decide, we uh, decide the font size depending on the user distance of the screen, not the device screen itself. Why? Because you read your, lap your mobile here. Your laptop is here and the TV is there. That's why the TV needs a bigger phone than your mobile. That's the why. Not because the device is smaller. So when we decide the, 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 the size, it's because of that. Just a quick tip, uh, when we decide the phone size, we should be thinking 
about having between 14 and 40 characters per line. More than that is bad for the user because if you, han, if you have, for Im imagine, 100 characters, it will be hard for the user to jump to the next line because it won't be easy to find the next one because uh, he don't know where is exactly the next one. So it should be between 40 and, fi and, and uh, 80 characters. So what the font size are, uh, fits there, that's the font size you need. As a general an, an average, we will say that on mobiles we will use the 14 pixels and 16 for the, for the de desktops. Some facts. Uh, do you remember the 200 cast that we said before on two seconds? Okay, it was, it's about 5% uh, for, uh, for fonts, that's 10 cast. And here we have the Open Sans, the super used open, open Sans font. Uh, the WOF, that is uh, the modern, uh, the, the best choice, it's 23 CAS. But that's a regular one. There's the Open Sans Italic, Open Sans Bold, and Open Sans Bold Italic. So just impossible 10 cast so do you do we really need fonts of course all of them no I don't think so so some tips about uh, user choosing uh, web fonts formats is that always if you if a browser is already reading some um, some format don't use more formats I mean for example the WOF everybody reads the WORF it's compatible with almost everything, Stereo Internet Explorer, but you can use EOT, the old EOT for Internet Explorer. If you already have that, don't use SVG. You don't need it. So keep the, the weight of, the, of, the, of your website and only use what you need. Do you remember the flash of invisible text we, see, we saw on the, on the, on the demo? Before of that, there was the flash of unstyled text. It was the browsers that displayed the, the default uh, font for, uh, from the system, but the font wasn't the same that you, you decided for your design. So suddenly when the browser got the font, everything just moved. So the browser said, let's remove it. And when we detect that uh, content is going to need a font, we just don't show the font. And became the, the, fault, the fault became there. So we have fault, fault, and none of them is the ideal. So some other stuff is going on. There are some ideas like uh, picking a font that is uh, really similar to your font, then adjusting it a little bit. But that's a work in progress, and there's no any standard way. But the best way would be if you can use system fonts, use them. Because for example, for text, they are really good. Some examples for uh, some ways for adding fonts to your, uh, to your websites would be the font face. The, it's powered by CSS, it's accessible. You don't need external plugins, but usually there are two big fonts and there's no common format. Another one would be fonts.com. You have a large selection, you have exclusive fonts like Oletica Neo, but you have to pay. You have Google Fonts, that is always only CSS, unless you want to use a uh, web font loader, I think it's named. It's really accessible. It's really cached. That's what I really like from Google Fonts, because it cached to the <coughs> phone. If you, go, if you visit one site, and then you go to another site that is always also using source sans, you don't need to download the phone again because it's already in your browser. And of course, it's really, really easy to implement. And also we have Typekit. We have the largest phone library there. It's accessible. It's also cached. It's easy to implement. And it has a premium service. You have to pay. And it's from Adobe. Uh, some tips. 
uh, fa about uh, uh, typography. Always try to keep the readability of your um, fonts. Choose the correct font size depending on the container. Use less fonts. Do we really need them? Maybe you need fonts for your uh, titles because they will see really good. But when you are on a 14 pixels font, there's no, there is no so huge difference between fonts. So do we really need them for the body? Sure, we need them. <laughs> <laughs> and use modern format, font formats always that you can. And of course, because it, reduce, it will reduce the page weight. So next step, images. They are really important on the traffic uh, on the web. <laughs> I, I really love this because that's, that's evident. Come on, everybody knows JPEG is for photos, PNG is for logos or plain images, PNG 24 bytes is for transparencies. Yes, everybody knows. We know that, but not the customer. I remember once when we were prepared, we were the day before of the launch of a big website and I was just checking the last check and it was like, wait, five, uh, five or six megabytes and it was like, oh my God, what's going on? And I realized that, for, that we, we use the default content to create some content for the website and test everything and the customer saw it and, and he said, great. I love that image, so he used that. But all the images were made on PNG, and they were photos. And we, the only thing that happened is that I had to change it, but because I realized about that. But the, custom, the customer didn't, so just try to keep it in mind. Some facts about, image, about images is that they are around 61% of the traffic on internet. The browser requests uh, the images asynchronously, so that's great. But we usually uh, load images too big for the device. So the aim should be to deliver the highest quality images supported, but nothing more, <coughs> not a bigger image. So to do so, we have the sc scaled images. We have several options, but one of them is scaled images where you will work, yeah. We have the Azure set here where we say which image should we use, the sizes and the fallback image. And that's just for changing resolutions, not for changing the image, only just to scale the image. We also have adapted images, that's a picture that you know, that's for changing images, for example, that one is horizontal and that one is vertical and they are completely different. Well, they are the same, but they, are, uh, they have different proportions. So we, will ha we have the picture that it's supported by everyone but Internet Explorer and Opera Mini. Um, we, will we have here the source where we define the different images each for each uh, resolution, we here we use media to say the where should it be seen, and we have the fallback image here. That's picture. So on uh, Drupal 8, we have responsive images, the old picture. Uh, in Core, <laughs> it's disabled by default, but it's really, uh, really, really quick to enable, and it has its support because uh, breakpoints already does different resolutions, and we also have lazy load, and on Drupal 7 is on the picture model, uh, is a country on Drupal 8. And I have a quick um, example of for creating responsive images. First, we just enable the model, then we go and create all the image styles that we are going to use on the responsive um, group. In that case, I'm just um, creating the, um, the teaser. Try to use it, that, to put the, uh, the, the pixels on the name. It's really useful, otherwise you can end up with 
50, 100 styles. Here I create the other one just a little bit quickly. I would love to work la that quickly. <laughs> and we have the three that we need. We go to responsive images. We create a new group. We say the teaser. And I choose a group, a breakpoints group. That one is from Bartik, because I'm working on Bartik. I choose each image uh, style for each image, uh, for each breakpoint. And we also define a fallback image for Internet Explorer and friends. And here we have, we already have it. I prepared a view, a super quick view, an easy view, where I ju we just add here the, the image. And we choose responsive format with the group teaser and that it's linked to the content. I reorder it because it's nicer. And that's all, we have it. We go here, we have a list of teasers. And if we resize it, we actually have responsive images. So you see the difference between the proportions. So that's, it's that easy now on Drupal 8. So it's really, really great. We are really lucky to have that on Drupal. We don't realize that sometimes, more far, far away, some people have troubles with that. So, Another thing that we have on Drupal 8 right now is the crop API. Uh, we have uh, the image widget crop module that where we can the, the user can choose exactly what part of the image want for each image style, image style sorry. And we also have focal, focal point that it's even easier. The user only choose where's, what's the most important part of the image and then automatically crops the image. Believe me, it's super easy to, to implement. And the user is like, oh, it's super easy. Drupal wow, rocks. So if you can, use it. Because by default on your websites, if you use responsive images, because it's super easy. And in the implementation, it's really easy. You just, you, you just choose, the, in, instead of uh, scale and crop, you just choose uh, in scale and crop focal point. And that's the only difference. So it really use it is really useful. What else? Designers' creativity. There's always one more thing on design. So, what if your designer, or me, I'm a designer also, uh, decides that on mobile he only wants one apple? So, responsive images doesn't work here. Yeah, so we need different images. What we usually do is we create, uh, there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing still on Drupal 8 for that, or on Drupal 7. What we do is we create our, uh, one uh, field for each image. Then we create the image style for each breakpoint. And then we prepare everything on, uh, on on Drupal 8, uh, on Drupal 7, it was a, a preprocess hook. Uh, on Drupal 8, I think we you don't really don't need to prepare it. It's a, um, a filter, but I'm not sure I've done this only on Drupal 7. And you finally print it on a custom template. You write the picture stuff on the template, and then you have it. So it's a way to solve the designer's creativity. What I was saying before is that there are solutions that people need because they don't work on Drupal, with Drupal. So there's a scaling based on the, there are solutions that scales based on the targeted end result, like responsive.io or other uh, solutions. There are also solutions that scale based on the URL, Cloudinary and other, other places. And there are solutions that scale based on media queries. So that's, there are some options out there. 
you wanna if you wanna use it, you can do it, but Drupal just works by default. SVGs. Um, I will need a complete session for to, uh, talking about that. But some of the most important thing about SVGs is that they are scaling. They are design control like they have uh, control uh, design control like interactivity and filters. They are waterproof. They are easy to make and to edit because they are cold, and they are highly compressible and you can manipulate with CSS and JavaScript unless you are working with Internet Explorer. So always, as you can, use SVGs. Don't use SVGs for photos, of course. But if you can use it, try to use them. Asynchronous loading. Ah, it doesn't work. What's the default behavior, for example, for JavaScript? Uh, there's a connection, the HTML, then the, the parser reads every line, and he found, for example, the CSS, after this, the, the first JavaScript, the second. But after it is rendered, the browser doesn't print anything. So we have a problem here, because we have to wait for that. There are some solutions out there, but it will be the default behavior. You place the script on the head just after the, the, the CSS. But we have the, the async property that will tell to the browser that it has to be, it, it, he has to wait, the, he doesn't have to wait for that. It's good because while the JavaScript is file is loading, the parsing of the document can continue. The JavaScript of execution no longer has to wait. But you can guarantee the order of the J JavaScript execution. The problem is that you remember that on the, um, the example that I said uh, from a list apart, there was the HTML, the CSS, jQuery, and modernizer. Because if you need some something from there, you, are, you need to be sure they are loaded first. There's another option th that's a defer that solves that a little bit. That's adding it, just adding the property defer there. It defer the scripts. Uh, the, the defer scripts are executed only when the the, the HTML has has been parsed. The deferred scripts will execute only uh, in order that they appear, but it has the potential the potential to interfere with the rendering of the page. So it's a little bit dangerous. And of course, the asynchronous has priority. So just keep that in mind. That's how the, the asynchronous loading could work. Uh, we, the, different, the most common options will be just having the typical JavaScript on the, on the head of your page or adding the, to that JavaScript these properties. You could also add the JavaScript here. And of course, you can add the JavaScript at the bottom of the body. That, those are the, the most common options. Proxy-based browsers. We always forget them, because come on, who uses Opera Mini? Ah, again, sorry. Uh, who uses Opera Mini? 250 million at least uses them. Okay, mainly on India, Indonesia, and that countries, maybe they are not our target, but they are hard users of that. So a lot of people use them. Uh, so we should keep this kind of browser, especially Opera Mini, in mind. Why? Uh, how these browsers work. They reduce the language, the, 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 the data that the browser is going to use, compressing the resources on a proxy server between the, the, the site and the user. The, there's a proxy server. And then sends to the client just the compressed version and parsed version of the, on, of the website. To work with them, we should try to use SVG rather than econ fonts. I don't know if you use econ fonts anymore, but try to use SVGs so instead of that. They are super cool, but they have a lot of troubles. 
not only on Opera Mini, but on other browsers. Always that you can style on your HTML with CSS, not JavaScript. Test your site without JavaScript, because sometimes the JavaScript just disappear. Of course, that make your site performant, because they, need, they, they use Opera Mini because they want to use less data. So ma making it performant is better. And that is obvious, but test on Opera Mini is not that, 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 that difficult to do. And it can help a lot of people. So I keep trying using that. Uh, progressive enhancement. That's uh, a really important thing, because uh, it helps a lot this kind of user that use uh, this kind of browser. The idea is using the basic content and the basic functionality for this kind of browsers like Opera Mini, and then serve an enhanced version uh, for advanced browser or the ones that have more brand which to use. And beyond the mouse, when we test, when we develop, we work with our mouse, but there are to touch even and keyboard even. We don't have the mouse on the on the on the smartphone, of course. So some tips to work with that is save the hover for shortcuts. Of course, the hover sometimes is really really useful, but if you um, make, for example, your navigation with the hover, people with smartphones will have a lot of troubles. There, uh, most of the operating systems have been developing different ways because the, uh, the hover is two clicks on iOS, for example. But to be safe, try to avoid the hover only for, uh, for other kind of stuff, for example, a different image, a different color, so, on. so don't use it for important thing. So be accessible in browser where a mouse pointer may not, may not exist. And don't assume that the touch will be used, but design as it will be. So don't design your navigation with hover. Another thing is keep in touch. What does it mean? That if you put the, the cursor with, uh, on the side of your finger, they are completely different. So when you design a button for a, for a smartphone, for a, for a mobile, it should be bigger. For the finger, it should be 70, uh, sorry, 57. And for the thumb, it's even bigger because we, you need more space. But not only for that, because only be, uh, on, not only because the, the, the space you need for the finger, but also because you need to have some safe space around it. And another just quick tip is don't overwrite system defaults. If the system use some gesture to move to another page or to go back on the history of your browser, don't overwrite it because you will annoy the user. So try to avoid it. And the last point is responsive design patterns. Patterns are really, really important because we really don't need to invent a wheel on each website we design. There are things that are super cool, but the user needs to <coughs> learn it. So the less things the user needs to learn on your site, more comfortable he will be there so he will stay there for more time. That's really good, for example, for commerce. Don't invent anything, because people need to feel safe, need to understand everything on the first uh, moment. So design patterns are recurrent solutions that solve common design problems. For example, navigation patterns. We have the typical off-site uh, navigation, like uh, Facebook. That's, that applies to menus, for tabs, for example, for breadcrumbs, for carousels, pagination. Always use a pattern if you can, because the user will remember it. For example, for forms, always as you can use a pattern, because the user it, uh, it will be uh, faster for the user. 
for dealing with data, for example, for slideshows, for tables, for autocompletes, for search things, always that you can try to use a pattern for that also, for shopping, for onboarding, for social. Then we have the progressive disclosure. That's a way of, um, what, that, what it does is showing you the most normal thing, the most important thing, the thing that most users do on the first place. For example, uh, here you have the, the email, so you click and you go to the, to, the, to the mail. But if you want to do more stuff, you have to move on right or on left, and you have some hidden uh, options. So the only show the main option, and then display, uh, show the other options only if the user needs them. And well, some conclusions about responsive nowadays. Keep adapting your workflow. It's really good to, to get new things on your workflow, on your workflow. Keeping weight. Take the most of new technologies because they can help you to make everything faster. Keep the user in mind, please. At the end, he will suffer your website, so think on them. And be prepared for the uncertain. We don't know how the browsers will work in five years, and probably the website is, will be still there. And the last one, keep evolving, because the website is doing that all the time. So that's all. Thank you. One more thing, there are the contribution sprint, sprints. They ask us to put that information here. And a little bit of spam. There's the front end United on Greece next year. It's Greece is amazing on Athens. So if you want to go there, just remember that it's there. And evaluate the session if you can. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs>